ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਸੋ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਫਾਰ ਹੈਵਿੰਗ ਮੀ ਮਾਈ ਨੇਮ ਇਜ਼ ਬਲਪ੍ਰੀਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਮੋਸਟ ਆਫ ਯੂ ਆਈ ਥਿੰਕ ਆਈ ਨੋ ਆਰ ਹੈਵ ਸੀਨ ਅਦਰਵਾਈਜ਼ ਫਾਰ ਥੋਸ ਆਫ ਯੂ ਹੂ ਹੈਵਨਟ ਆਈ ਐਮ ਲੀਗਲ ਕਾਉਂਸਲ ਵਿਦ ਦ ਵਰਲਡ ਸਿਕ ਆਰਗੇਨਾਈਜੇਸ਼ਨ ਆਫ ਕੈਨੇਡਾ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਹਵ ਡਨ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਕੈਂਪਸ ਇਨ ਇੰਗਲੈਂਡ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਹਵ ਡਨ ਅ ਕਪਲ ਹੀਅਰ ਸੋ ਇਟਸ ਆਲਵੇਜ਼ ਅ ਪਲੇਜਰ ਥਿਸ ਇਜ਼ ਅ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲ ਈਅਰ ਫਾਰ ਆਲ ਆਫ ਅਸ ਇਟਸ 30 years after 1984 so 1984 is something that still uh, pulls at our heartstrings it's very uh, it's a very sensitive issue for us and we talk about shahidi we talk about the shahids of june 1984 we talk about the shahids of uh, november 1984 and we talk about all the shahids uh, after 1984 but every day in our ardas jinna singa singh ne tarm hai sis te we talk about those shahids but what does shahidi mean there are a lot of misconceptions um there are a lot of uh, people that don't quite understand the difference between for example in india anyone that dies uh in a battle or anyone that dies uh for the cause of the nation is called a shaheed some people are taking that interpretation that understanding of shahidi and understanding that to be uh the sick understanding so what i want to do is threefold one talk about the ideal of shahidi what is the sick principle of shahidi what is that ideal the second part of the lecture i want to focus on is sick leadership often our shaheeds have been our leaders um so what does our leadership look like and finally uh, i want to talk about the current situation in the sick month uh and what what do we really need yeah. one thing i want to stay uh, say at the outset these are my vichar uh, that i've uh, come to an understanding of so if someone doesn't un- doesn't agree that's totally fine i'm not claiming to be an authority i'm just giving you my uh, understanding and secondly this isn't meant to say who is a shaheed who isn't a shaheed so i don't want any questions well is that person a shaheed then because I, i'm no one to judge this is just to tell you what my understanding of that ideal is next slide so what is the meaning of shaheed uh the word shaheed appears sometimes in, in gurbani in in sikh literature it's not as common it became much more common uh when that era of shaheeds began uh obviously after guru arjan dev ji but more so in the 18th century the root of the word shaheed is shahada which means witness so a witness is someone that's willing to testify to the faith is willing to stand on oath and, and on their own uh on their own honor swear to that faith like you have someone that becomes a witness in a case they swear that they will tell the truth they're a witness to that the word martyr interestingly enough uh, the word martyr uh, has the same root which is witness the word martyr actually also means witness so essentially for us as six it means someone who sacrificed themselves for their faith next slide what it doesn't mean it doesn't mean a shaheed is not simply someone that dies on the battlefield a shaheed isn't su- simply someone that gave their life up for a cause now there's a punjabi ideal now we always talk about the difference between punjabi culture and sikh culture there's some overlap but there are very significant differences in punjabi culture we often look up to people that are very macho that uh that are warriors that don't stop on the battlefield we look up to them we idealize them so you have people like jiona mor dulla patti or jaga daku Uh, these are all been people that punjabi literature has uh, looked up upon as heroes but what does gurbani tell us about simply warriors so this is a shabd sure ena aankhiye ahankar mare dukh paave sura means brave warriors we know what a sura is right surma that's not a brave warrior that's not a surma who simply dies on the battlefield in ego so if someone's fighting an ego that's not a warrior for us that's not a surma for us ande aap na pehchanani dooje pach jaave 
that they're blind to who they themselves are. They're blind, that they've become blinded by their ego, by their uh, anger, and they die in duality. They fight with intense anger, intense anger. And in this world and the next world, they will find pain. So imagine that. We're thinking of this warrior, sometimes even paintings of Guru Gobind Singh Ji, we see the like this. That's not the ideal of a Sikh warrior. Harjiyo ahankarna pavai, ved kuk sunave. That Vaiguru is not pleased by ego, whether that's on the battlefield or otherwise. Ahankar moe se vigati gaye, mar janme firyame. So this is a very important line. In Indian literature, someone that died on the battlefield was said to a virgati pagya, a surm a virgati pagya, which meant the equivalent of shaheed. Virgati is the Hindu or the Indic equivalent of shaheed, but Guru Sahib uses that word and changes it and says, ahankar moe, those that have died in ego on the battlefield, se vigati gaye, without gut, without liberation. Not virgati, o vigati gaye. Mar janme firayame. They will die and they will be born again. So, a complete contrast to that ideal of the warrior that never turns his back on the battlefield. If you are fighting in ego, if you are fighting in anger, then Guru Sahib has discounted that, saying that you will die and you will be born again, and Vaiguru is not pleased by this. Next slide. So where does Shahidi or where does this warrior tradition, this Surma tradition start in Sikhi? It starts with Amrit. What does Amrit mean? Mrit means death, A uh, means without. So without death. And there are several shabs that are very well known to us that will explain what that fearlessness uh, concept is in Sikhi. So the first is Slok Mahalla Panjama, Pelna Marna Kabul Jeevan Ki Chhad Aas. First accept death, accept that you have died, and leave all hope of life. Ho Savna Ki Renaka To Hamare Paas. Then become the dust of all people's feet, then come to me. So the warrior that's fighting an ego, that's fighting with anger, contrast that with someone that has accepted death, but then becomes the dust of everyone's feet. That then comes into nimrta, that comes into humility. Then the shabd that is recited often when someone wants to shak amrit, the panj uh, have often traditionally recited this to someone that wants to shak amrit. Uh, the shabd is, Joto prem khelan ka chao, sirta tali gali meri yao. That if you want to play the game of love, put your head on your palm and come on my path. This is Guru Nanak Dev Ji speaking. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is giving this message. Sometimes we associate putting the head on the palm with Baba Deep Singh or with Guru Gobind Singh Ji. But this is Guru Nanak Dev Ji saying, you want to play the game of love, you want to follow my path, then put your, hand, uh, put your head on your hand and then come. It marag pair tri jai, sir di jai, kaan na ki jai. That if you put your foot on this path, then don't look back. That don't care about what the world says. That that's the path of Gursikhi. That this is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. And then you have Hamri Jat Pat Gur Sat Gur Ham Vetio Sir Gurke. There's so many shabds in Gurbani that talk about giving your head to the Guru, that give your head to the Guru. Uh, and then Nanak Sir De Chutia Darga Pat Pai, that you give your head to the Guru, and then you'll find a place in Darga in the next world, in Vaigdu's court. Next slide. So the concept of giving one's head, sacrificing one's head, it started with Guru Nanak Dev Ji, and then it continued with every Guru. The, when we Janapa Matha take deya, what are we doing? We're essentially offering our head to the Guru. When Guru Gobind Singh Ji got up on the stage in, at Vasakhi, and he demanded a head, he asked for a head. Now, it wasn't unusual at all, because Sikhi from day one has asked for a head. It was a drama that some, uh, those Panjipyari understood, the others might not have understood. 
but guru gobind singh ji has always asked for a head guru nanak dev ji has always asked for a head so amrit is the end of one life which is our life the one that i'm living for myself and it's the beginning of an eternal life that life which will never end that it doesn't end with death that it exists within the guru and because the guru is without death then that sikh becomes without death and how does that death happen shabd maro phir jeevo sadhi ta phir marna hoyi that you will die in the shabd guru's word ode vich you will lose yourself and when that death happens then that physical death really doesn't matter anymore because it's just another stage physical death becomes irrelevant because you are immortal in the shabd you are immortal in the guru so a sikh becomes a jinda shaheed ideally that they are a living martyr to the guru and they are dead to themselves and alive for the guru so physical death is irrelevant to a sikh and that's where uh, that's where this concept of shaheedi comes from uh, one thing i wanted to talk about a little bit is rather than talking about dying for the panth uh, how about living for it when this rajawana incident took place a lot of people whether they were amritari whether they were not amritari whether they just had a very remote connection uh, to sikhi what they started saying was i am ready to die for the panth and what i want to talk about in today's presentation a little bit more is you can't say that i want to die for the panth if you haven't lived for the panth if you haven't lived for your guru you can't say that i will die for my guru next slide so the sikh approach to shahidi <clears throat> bhai gurdas ji was a very amazing guru sikh he was the nephew of guru amar das ji uh but he had the time to spend uh, he had he spent time with guru amar das ji guru ram das ji guru arjan dev ji uh, guru har gobind sahib ji and he was an ideal of sikhi what sikhi should look like so when he talks about sikhi it's from a first hand perspective what does he say he says and this is one of the few places where you'll find a definition of a shaheed uh, in sikh literature bhai gurdas ji says murda hoye murid na galli hovna that a, a sikh should be dead to himself that that chela should be dead but gal, na galli hovna it's not going to happen through talk talk is cheap i've talked about this before that simply saying that i am a sikh is not enough it has to be a character it has to be the following that you have of the guru that's where the real content of your character is that's where you actually become a sikh not just in the talk sabar sidq shaheed param pao khovna so here bhai gurdas has laid out every trait that a shaheed should have sabar means patience sidq means faith and then shaheed we understand param pao khovna that this person loses all doubt loses all fear so to go over those qualities of a shaheed that in the sikh tradition we understand that patience faith and losing all doubt and fear so fearless and without doubt there's another shabd that bhai gurdas has written to explain what a sikh should be like and i think this is very important to understand what uh, a sikh's attitude towards uh, shahidi or service is uh, talks about water it talks about the analogy between water and wh- what a gur sikh is so bhai gurdas ji says dharti paira heth hai dharti heth fasanda pani that the earth is below our feet but even below the earth is water talking about nimrata talking about humility that the dust is considered the lowest but water becomes even lower than the dust pani challa niwan no pani pani challa niwan no nirmal sital shuddh purani that water goes downwards its very instinct is not to go up it it goes down and what is it by nature it's pure it's cool it's very clean bahut rangi ek rang hai sabna andar ikko jaani that it may become different colors as the need arises but at the end it's in all of us and it becomes it's remains its same color 
ਤੱਤਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਧੁੱਪ ਵਿੱਚ ਛਾਵੇਂ ਠੰਡ ਵਿਰਤੀ ਹਾਣੀ ਤਪਦਾ ਪਰ ਉਪਕਾਰ ਨੂੰ ਠੰਡੇ ਪਰ ਉਪਕਾਰ ਵਿਹਾਣੀ that it might become hot or cool depending on the sun or uh, the moon or whatever else but what does it do it becomes hot or cold for par upkar to serve others so god sick in the same way if they become hot or cold their temperament becomes hot or cold it's not something about ego it's to serve others par upkar that's the word you want to underline agan bujaye tapt vich thanda hove bilam na aani that when it becomes hot when it's putting out a fire if it puts out a fire it might become hot but it doesn't take any time to become cool again gursikhi di eo nishani that this is the mark of a gursik that even where they may become hot for parupakar to put out a fire that they will come back to their natural state of purity of coolness very quickly that is the ideal of a shaheed that is the ideal of a sikh next slide calls us call to arms so by mananinder singh yesterday mentioned that we aren't uh, bound by either the indian ideal of ahimsa or the belief that religions should not have a political aspect to them or that they should never uh, they should never raise arms we don't believe that we believe that a sikh carries arms and we believe they can raise arms and in fact anyone that suggests otherwise whether they're a sikh or, or a non sikh is misleading you anyone that says that if my family is being attacked i will simply sit there either they're i would suggest being ignorant or they're lying to you anyone will protect their family anyone will protect themselves a sikh simply says it that i won't just protect myself and my family i'll protect anybody but let's talk about that at the outset i will say guru gobind singh ji has explained uh, this is a very famous quote of guru gobind singh ji jo kar az hama hil te dar guzast halal ast burdan ba shamshir e dast this is a persian verse from the zafar nama that was written to aurangzeb that guru gobind singh ji is saying when all other means have been exhausted that means all others then it is halal it is right to take the sword in your hand but what does that mean it has to be with the approval of the guru and the panth so how does the guru give approval we've already seen that a gursik can become hot a gursik can raise arms but for what for that keyword parupakar and for a gursik parupakar nitchit vate nahi kash poch that a gursik is always trying to think of parupakar always trying to think of how can i serve and then the other is par brahm ke bhakt nirvad they don't do it out of hatred they don't do it because they're an enemy of anybody they're nirvad without hatred so what is the khalsa's mission and this is what vai guru told guru gobind singh ji before sending him to this world guru gobind singh ji in bachitra natak has written very clearly what he was sent here to do and that is dharm chalavan sant ubaran to propagate dharm righteousness sant ubaran to save sants those who are dedicated to vai guru dosht saban ko mool uparan that those dosht those tyrants i am here to root them out from the root mool means root i am here to pull their roots out and that is what the khalsa which is the the children of guru gobind singh ji are here to do so this has to be a selfless act not a selfish one taking arm taking up arms for any other purpose is actually uh, an insult to our khalsa tradition and also to our arms guru gobind singh ji has written yehi hamare peer so our weapons a khalsa's weapons are their peer their saint you don't take you don't take your peer somewhere where you might embarrass your saint you don't take your saint somewhere where it might be uncomfortable for him or her you want to take your saint somewhere where the glory of that saint will increase those peer so shastra are our saints guru gobind singh ji has given them the name of saint for this that you want to treat them like saints that put them in a situation where their glory will be increased not will they be insulted so when we pull our shastra out uh, we say this jokingly but it's actually a very serious uh, situation where we pull our karpans out at our gurdware to argue over who gets to open the golak those 
incidents, do they bring shobha, do they bring glory to our shastars? Or do they bring insult? So obviously that's not a Sikh warrior tradition. That's not in the Sikhi context of what's acceptable. Because we insult our karpan. Karpan can only be used for parapukar. Next slide. Khalsa Khanda philosophy. This is an interesting concept that I want you to understand. The Khanda has two edges. Has two edges. And it comes to a point. I've put the picture there so you can all see. That it comes to one point. Might have two edges, but it ends at one point. And the Khanda represents Bibek. Represents unity out of duality. So where there are two competing concepts, the Khalsa isn't thrown off by that. The West is, often, but the Khalsa doesn't get thrown off by duality. We understand it to be unity. So what does that mean? Miri versus Piri. In, here, in Western tradition, we also hear about the separation of church and state because that upsets them that it seems as though it's two different things. How can it exist in one? No, we say Miri and Piri exist together. We say that Sant can exist with a Sipahi. It has to exist together. We say that Shantras, which means the calm nature, has to exist with the Bidas. Shantras and Bidas exist at the same place. And Josh exists with Hosh. You know what Josh is means feeling passion, and Hosh means rational thought. They both have to exist at the same place. And this is Bibekdan. Bibek means be tu to ek. That is the symbol of the Khanda. Khanda represents Bibek. How is this possible? It's only possible through Nam, Barni, and Rath. So no one can, through an intellectual exercise, unify these two things within themselves. They cannot become uh, a Sant and a Spahi just by thinking about it. They cannot put Josh and Hosh together just by thinking about it. It has to come through following the Guru's path. This is what the Guru's Shabd magically is able to do. It's able to put these competing things inside you as one. And there's one other thing that uh, it's important to point out that this is written by Savranti Singh's book and I've heard from other Gursikhs that ideally a Shaheed is one who has had Darshan of Vaigru, Jyot Vigas. But Paisav has written in his book that where someone on the orders of the Panth for the service of the Panth sacrifices their life. At that point, the Guru will keep the Lodge of the Amrit. Jira Amrit Shakya, Odi Lodge Guru Sahib Rakhdene, Jira O Kinka Thorte Vichya Amrit Amrit Shakan Vele, that that will then sprout into a, a, a plant. It will uh, show its color, that you will become a Shaheed. But it's not the ideal. The ideal is someone that has had Dashana Vaiguru, that is one with Vaiguru in their life, and that they can then sacrifice their life for the service of others. Next slide. So the Khalsa's Bidras. I mentioned two things, Bidras and Shantras. There are two types of general, generally two types of Shahidiyya that we understand in the Sikh tradition. One is Bidras. Bidras means the warrior that fights on the battlefield. And the other is Shantras, the one that dies is executed, is essentially martyred without putting up uh, resistance, without fighting. There's two things, but they don't exist separately. They exist as one. So Khalsa's Bidras, it exists to protect those in need and destroy oppression. It's without anger, animosity, or ego. So that's very important. We mentioned that at the start, that a normal warrior fights in anger and ego. A Sikh will not fight with any of those. Desire to sacrifice for love. The desire is that I may become a sacrifice for my Guru. And there's so many Tukka and Gurbani. There's other faiths that might sacrifice goats, that might sacrifice animals to Vaiguru. And a Sikh in the Sikh tradition will say, ke bal 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 sad balehar, that I am not even enough. If I sacrifice everything of myself, that's not enough to be a sacrifice to you. It's not a worthy sacrifice. In Jabji Sahib, Vaidana Jama Ekvar, that I can't even become a sacrifice one time. 
So forget sacrificing animals. We don't even consider sacrificing ourselves to be enough of a worthy sacrifice for Vaiguru. When this warrior fights, they have an inner connection with Vaiguru that's unbreaking. There's no fear because Amrit is inside them. They've already died physically. Uh, to death, they, it's irrelevant. Resort to arms is for the universal good. When they fight, those people they fight, they're not doing anything bad to them. They're in fact doing them a favor. Because they're conducting pop. They're engaging in activities that are bad for their spirituality even. So putting an end to that, either by turning them away from their course of action, or in fact even by ending them, if that has to be the case, it's putting an end to activities that, is, are, that are in fact bad for their own spirituality. And the power behind the sick is namras. You have the physical khanda that is in the hand of Baba Deep Singh, but the khanda that you cannot see is the internal namda khanda that is always going. So while that external khanda is being wielded by the sick warrior, that external weapon is being used, the internal nam khanda is going at the same time. I want to give you a couple of examples. First of all, Guru Hargobind Sahib. Guru Hargobind is considered the first Sikh warrior. When he fought Pende Khan, this is the picture of Pende Khan. Pende Khan was a good, was very close to Guru Hargobind Sahib. And he cheated Guru Hargobind Sahib. I'm not going to tell the whole story. He cheated Guru Hargobind Sahib and Guru Hargobind Sahib threw him out of the Darbar. He went and joined with the Mughals. He joined with them and he brought an army to attack Kartarpur Sahib. Now imagine that someone that's been your ally since, since he was born essentially, uh, he comes after betraying you with an army. He joins with the enemy. What sort of feeling would a normal so-called warrior feel? It would be of intense anger of, I have to destroy this person. But when Guru Hargobind Sahib sees him on the battlefield, he doesn't have any anger on his face. He says, go first. You're here to fight me. Pende Khan had declared to the Mughals that no one else can fight Guru Hargobind. I'll fight him. I'll show you how he's defeated. Guru Hargobind Sahib said, go. Do what you want. He gives his first var. It doesn't land. Guru Hargobind Sahib gives him another opportunity. Second time, again, nothing happens. Third opportunity. And then Guru Hargobind Sahib replies and cuts him down with one with one blow. Pende Khan falls to the ground. And what does Guru Hargobind Sahib do? He goes down on his knees, he takes his shield and he covers Pende Khan's face from the sun, that his face isn't going to burn. There's no anger, there's no hatred. And he says to Pende Khan, Kalma Padla. He sees that his last moments are here now. He says, read the Kalma. And Pende Khan, he's touched by the Guru, he sees the Guru's face and his head is now on Guru Hargobind Sahib's lap. His face is being shaded by Guru Sahib's shield. And he says, I don't need to read the Kalma. I've seen your face. And he dies. There's no hatred when that person is on the ground. Paikana Ji, we all know the story. Paikana Ji says that I can't see any enemies. Once they're wounded, they're all the same to me. And Guru Gobind Singh Ji agrees and says, don't just give them water, give them medicine, tie their wounds. Guru Gobind Singh Ji, whoever's seen Guru Gobind Singh Ji's arrows will know that they used to have gold bands around them. So, in mo modern traditional understandings of warfare, if you want to kill someone, it's good in fact if their family suffers. Guru Gobind Singh Ji insisted that his arrows have to have gold bands around them so that if someone is shot by them, if they die, and inevitably I would expect they would have, the family can afford a funeral, they can take care of themselves with the gold that's attached to the arrow. There's no hatred here. It's a question of putting this person off the path that they've chosen, which is destroying humanity. That's the whole purpose. There's compassion here. This is a compassionate warrior that is without hatred. I can't stress that enough. And the Sikh is fighting out of love for the Guru. It's a love story. That the Guru says, I will do everything for you, and the Sikh says, no, I will do anything I can for you. It's like the love between milk and water. This is an example we get out of Gurbani, that 
the water says, I will destroy myself first, that I won't let anything happen to you. And the milk says, no, I will come out of the pot. If you're boiling us, that I will come out of the pot to put the fire out, but I won't let anything happen to you. It's intense love between the Sikh and the Guru that the Sikh says, I will do anything for you. Next slide. And the other side to that is Khalsa Shantras. Shantras means that Shidi that happens not on the battlefield, but uh, at the hands of the executioner. And there's a tuk from Gurbani that says, Kaha pe ho jo tan pe ho chien chien, prem jai to dar pe hai jan. That what do I care if my body's being cut to pieces? It doesn't matter to me if my body's being cut to pieces. If my love for you is being affected, then I'm going to be afraid. But if my body's being cut to pieces, what difference does it make? It makes no difference. It exists at one with Bidras. Shantras doesn't mean that you don't have any options. It doesn't mean that uh, you accept this pain because you have no choice. It is an act of strength. It is a choice that a good Sikh makes, that I will go this way, and we'll talk about why, but it is not a compulsion that someone's being killed and they have no choice and they've chosen Shantras. This Ahimsa movement in India, it is the complete opposite. It's because they feel powerless. They feel they have no option. So if you have no option, that the best thing is to uh, just close your mouth and say, I'm non-violent, that I will accept a peaceful, I will accept death quietly. No, a Gursikh has all the power they need, but they will then go forward and still accept that death. And it's without any fear. So what are the reasons for a Shantra Shahidi? And there are four general ones that I've outlined. There are others as well, but these are the four general ones. One is exposing tyranny by enduring it on oneself. So to expose the tyranny of a regime by taking all of that punishment upon oneself. Inspiring others then to fight against that tyranny. By becoming a, an example, inspiring the others around you. Third, allowing the karmic debt of oppressors to accumulate and then destroy that evil. We believe in karm. We believe that regimes have karm as well. That if you kill innocents, especially innocents that have a lot of bhakti, you are bringing yourself to an end very, very quickly. And then finally, the orders of the Panth. Now, this is a picture of Guru Arjun Dev Ji, who was our first Shaheed. Most of us know the story, but I want to point out how he was made a Shaheed. The Mughals claimed descent from the Mongols, so Genghis Khan. And the, Geng and the Mongols and the Mughals had a belief that someone who is spiritually inclined, you shouldn't spill their blood or it'll destroy your, uh, destroy your regime, it'll destroy your rule. So they had a special way of killing uh, spe people who are, spe uh, who are spiritual. They called it Yasa. And Jahangir has specifically put in his memoirs that uh, Guru Arjan should be put to death through Yasa. So that's why he wasn't cut with a blade. He was first put on the Tati Tavi. He was then put in the boiling cauldron. And the third step, which Guru Arjan Dev Ji didn't get to, uh, in our understanding, is to be sown alive in a hide. So a fresh hide from a cow or some other animal. Uh, they would take this and they would sow the person alive in it. So imagine that that's a stomach uh, or a hide of this freshly killed animal. And then they throw you in the sun and it slowly shrinks and shrivels and crushes you inside of it. Guru Arjan Dev Ji was the embodiment of Shantaras for us. He had every power. Mia Mead, according to the story, came to Guru Arjan and said, if you want, I can use my spiritual power to make Dilli and Lahore fight. They will destroy themselves. And Guru Arjan Dev Ji said, so I, I, if, I, if I wanted to, I don't have to go through this. But there's a reason for it. And Guru Arjan Dev Ji became an example to us because Guru, the Gurus never asked us to do something they didn't do themselves or couldn't show us first. They showed us how to go through the Shahidi in the ideal manner. Tera kiya mitha lage, that whatever you're doing is sweet to me. Next slide. Other examples according to that same theme. Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib, how does Guru Gobind Singh describe Guru Tegh Bahadur Shahidi? 
ਠੀਕਰ ਫੋਰ ਦ ਲੀਸ ਸਰ ਪ੍ਰਾਪਰ ਕੀਆ ਪਿਆਨ ਦਟ ਹੀ ਟੁਕ ਦ ਵੇਸ ਆਫ ਹਿਸ ਬਾਡੀ ਗੁਰੂ ਤੇਗ ਬਹਾਦਰ ਠੀਕਰ ਫੋਰ ਕਿ ਆਪਣਾ ਤਨ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਠੀਕਰਾ ਸੀ ਹੀ ਸਮੈਸ਼ਡ ਇਟ ਔਨ ਦ ਹੈਡ ਆਫ ਦ ਮੁਗਲ ਐਮਪਾਇਰ ਤੇਗ ਬਹਾਦਰ ਸੀ ਕਰਿਆ ਕਰੀ ਨਾ ਕਿਨ ਹੂ ਆਨ ਵਾਟ ਗੁਰੂ ਤੇਗ ਬਹਾਦਰ ਡਿਡ ਨੋ ਵਨ ਐਲਸ ਕੁਡ ਹਵ ਡਨ ਐਂਡ ਇਟਸ ਅ ਰੈਕਗਨਾਈਜ਼ਡ ਫੈਕਟ other religions might be based on mythology or stories we shouldn't fall into that same trap it's a recognized fact that after guru teg bahadur shahidi after that period in time the mughal rule never ascended it was a regular descent it was a constant descent guru teg bahadur smashed his own self on this tyrannical rule and caused it to finish and at the same time there are three gursikhs that accompanied him and also went through the same tortures and same shahidi another example we know a lot about pai taru singh but pai taru singh if you read panth prakash which is written by uh, ratan singh pangu who was ratan singh pangu yesterday maninder singh talked about pai sukha singh and mehtab singh pai uh, mehtab singh's grandson is ratan singh pangu and he had first hand knowledge of those incidents that took place then so under all this oppression by taru singh most of us see, have seen the cartoon uh, but what was the thinking behind that why did pai taru singh do that and panth prakash says this laying the blame for his sacrifice squarely on lahore's nawab pai taru singh would make the nawab face divine retribution keeping his faith with hair intact till last breath pai taru singh would lay the blame squarely on the moguls acquiescing and abiding with the will divine would taru singh succeed in pr- proving the moguls guilty praise be to the singhs who wage a religious war praise be to praise be to him who sacrifices accusing the moguls so pai taru singh according to ratan singh pangu his ideal was that i am going to go to dargah and i am going to testify that this is what happened to me and this regime deserves to be destroyed that because of his sacrifice vaiguru will do retribution and destroy the evil the interesting part that most of us don't know we know sukha singh mehtab singh most of us don't know that pai mehtab singh was the best friend of pai taru singh they had shakt amal together so pai mehtab singh we know the story of him cutting off the head of masa singh uh, masa rangad what we don't know is that after that he was an outlaw he was an outlaw with his jatha he had stayed in punjab but he had about 50 singhs and when he found out that pai taru singh has courted arrest he said my best friend has gone and i'm not going to be an outlaw anymore i'm not going to run around being afraid that i might be captured i'm going to go with him i'm going to join him on his mission so pai mehtab singh's shahidi actually happened because he went and presented himself in front of the nawab and said do whatever you want you have pai taru singh my only request is that you let me see him once and then you can do whatever you want pai mehtab singh had darshan of pai taru singh and then he was put on the charkhadi and he was broken on the charkhadi so this amazing warrior who could have done whatever he wanted he he wasn't powerless he had all the power he had a jatha of sings he'd already cut off some uh, a very powerful uh, person's head masarangar's head he could have done whatever he wanted but no he joined pai taru singh as an act of showing a the tyranny of the regime and second being a testimony a shaheed testimony in front of vaiguru that this is the oppression it needs to end next slide modern day examples shantras and biras together the best uh, one of the best examples that i've read of is of pai sarvan singh phallewal now pai sarvan singh phallewal story comes in the book rangle sajjan he was a companion of pai rantir singh and the story goes that he would fall into meditation into samadhi just walking around so he would be standing his naam the khanda is always going and sometimes it's going so strongly that he loses awareness of where he is so the sings are going on a train and he's standing in line for the train and while waiting he's jumping naam and he falls into samadhi and the crowd behind him is increasing people are getting agitated why isn't this guy moving in line and a, a british police officer comes and he shakes him he says move move two or three times he shakes him and eventually he slaps by sarvan singh and by sarvan singh is awoken by this 
and everyone is watching. The Sikh has just been slapped by this British officer. What is he going to do? So Pai Sarwan Singh understands the situation that I've been holding the line up. This man has just slapped me. He puts his hand together and he asks for forgiveness. Said, I didn't know, I'm sorry. There's a Hindu gentleman there and he starts mocking Pai Sarwan Singh. And he starts mocking the Singhs, saying, look at the big Singh, he's gotten afraid of this British officer. Look at that. So he's mocking him and Pai Sarwan Singh and the rest of the Singhs aren't saying anything. He's saying, look, they're afraid of the British. All the Singhs get on the train, this Hindu gentleman gets on the train as well. And there's a break, the tr trains used to stop for breaks. And the Singhs get off and by Sarvan Singh, he has a commotion in a wooded area. And what had happened was three British soldiers, three, had taken an Indian woman into the secluded area and were going to rape her. By Sarvan Singh goes, in, hears the commotion, sees what's happening, and he single-handedly beats these three and binds them. And everyone else then hears the sounds, and they come and see this one Singh, the same Singh, has now tied up these three British officers and he's saying to this Hindu woman, this Indian woman, that what do you want to do? Do you want these people to be charged? Do you want to take them to the police station? Or do you want money? And she says, just give me money. And these British officers then beg too that we'll just give them money. So they give money and she says, let them go. This Hindu gentleman then says, I take everything back. I didn't understand that I didn't know things were like this. So where it was for his own ego, I can say for myself, honestly, if I'm slapped by somebody, I don't think I have it in me to ignore it. I will do something about it. But imagine the heights of Gursikhi that your own ego, where nothing else was involved, just his own ego, he didn't do anything. He came to Nimrta. And that's where uh, Sheikh Farid Ji's sloks, Bureda Palakar, Gussa Manna Hindai, so many other sloks that talk about if someone slaps you, it's okay. It doesn't matter. That's the kamai of that Gursik. But when it came to saving someone that needed help, saving someone that was being oppressed, he single-handedly defeated these three British officers. I want to talk also about the Nkarna Sahib Saka of 1921. This was an example of the Panth, as Pai Sahib said yesterday, the Panth had decided that Nankarna Saab, which was a Gurdwara controlled by a Mahant, the Mahant had been raping women there, gambling, drinking. The Panth wanted control of this Gurdwara. But the Panth decided that no weapons will be used, no violence will be used. By Lashmar Singh led a Jatha to court arrest there, to protest there. And by Lashmar Singh, he had all the power he wanted. The Singhs were trained how to fight. There were some former soldiers there, they could have done whatever they wanted. But when they got there, bound by the hukum of the Panth, they were cut piece by piece. In the most brutal manner, they were executed. By Lachman Singh was first shot, and then he was hung upside down from a tree and he was burnt alive. But he had sworn under the orders of the Panth that I will not raise a hand. That's another example of Shahidi that shamed the regime, that at the next instant, they gave the, the keys to Nankarna Saab to the Panth. He accomplished what he wanted to do. He became an example to us. So it's not always violence that a Shahid has to go through to accomplish his mission or her mission. The 13 Shahids of 1978, I want to talk a little bit about this as well. 1978 woke the Panth up. But what was it essentially? It was 13 Gursikhs that died. But who were they? They were all Nama Bias Kamai Wale. And we to this day still talk about what they did. So I think we all know about the Narankari Saka, what the Narankaris were all about. But imagine we talk about the Biras of Baba Deep Singh, we talk about the Pratan warriors. We don't focus, and maybe on purpose that we're not allowed to focus on the on the warriors like by Fauja Singh. By Fauja Singh went there on without any significant arms, just with his regular Tal Karpan. And when they were attacked, he fought in a way that was unimaginable. He couldn't be stopped. He was shot in the eye. There's a picture that is quite graphic of Pai Fauja Singh's dead body. His eye is completely destroyed. 
That didn't stop him. He took his damala, tied it over his eye, and continued to fight. Finally, a police officer empties his gun into Pai Sab's chest, and even that doesn't kill Pai Sab. He continues meditating on Vaigru. Pai Avtar Singh, who was another Singh there, seeing that the end is coming, he sits down and he falls into a samadhi, and his death took place because while he was in samadhi, they cracked his skull with sticks. These Singhs, with their 13 shahidiyya, they set the course for the Panth for the next, I don't know how many years. So we talk about 1984 when thousands and thousands of Sikhs were killed, but we still talk about 1978, where these 13 Sikhs and their Naam Kumai set an example for all of us. They changed the course of the Panth because of their Naam Kumai. And finally, we talk about Sant Janal Singh being a revolutionary leader of the 20th century. We talk about him being the last Sikh leader who we can look up to. But who was Sant Janal Singh? There's a book by a professor called Harpal Singh uh, Pannu. He's just recently written it, actually. And he writes that we used to go to Sant Kartar Singh and spend time with him. And we used to see Pai Janal Singh in the Jatha. And he was always doing part. And we didn't like him because of that, because he would never socialize with us. We used to hang out with Pai Amrik Singh, he used to be just like us, he used to study, he used to joke around with us. Pai Jarnayal Singh would not do any of those things. And then one day we complained to Sant Kartar Singh, Kabi, ye ho jaya? and Pai Sant Kartar Singh said to them, these were all educated young boys, he said, Changa Sikhya. And Harpal Singh says that we replied to Sant Kartar Singh, Oh, we Sikhya, Asi we Sikhya, Kada Prashat, Asi Sada hiya. And he goes, Kada Prashad, Ede Kada Prashad ko jyada hai kyo pya lagda. He goes, a little bit too much kyo in his Kada Prashad, something wrong with his head. So when it was time to pick the next successor of Sant Kartar Singh, they were supporting Pai Amrik Singh. That we think Pai Amrik Singh, who's educated, MA, uh, he should be the next Jathedar of the Taksal. But all the other Singhs in the Taksal, they were saying, no, Sant Janal Singh should be the next Mukhi. And he goes, we lost, we weren't happy about it. But when Sanjay Janal Singh got up on the stage for the first time, he spoke with such clarity, with such purpose, without any notes, that we were spellbound. And Badal, same Badal that we see today, had gotten up to speak before Sanjay Janal Singh, and he'd said, Sant Kartar Singh was a great man, and if the Taksal needs anything, that you can ask today and our government will give it to you because he was the chief minister in 1978 as well. And before 1978, this is 1977 or 76. Sanjay Nelson gets up after in his speech and he closes with this. He says, the chief minister Badal has just said that if we want anything, we should ask now. He says, this taksal is following the path of Guru Gobind Singh. We don't need anything. So I will say to Prakash Singh Badal, if there's anything you want, ask from us today, and we'll give it to you. And all these people that thought he was a mindless person that has too much kyo in his prashad, they were s amazed that he's already taking a panga with the chief minister. What's going on here? That how did he get all this gyan? So the leadership of Sam Janel Singh, once again, I want to focus on this because he was seen as the last significant Sikh leader that we all look up to. He did support Hathiyar Ban Sangar. He did encourage followers to take up arms. But when? After 1978, the court case against uh, Gurbachan and Narkatari, he waited until that concluded. So the court cases against all those people that were accused of killing the 13 Singhs, they concluded with acquittals for everybody. No one was convicted. He saw that the system isn't working. Young Sikhs are being picked up and being killed. These 13 people have not been convicted by the court system. And when he saw that the state isn't following its own rules, the state isn't following any uh, regulations, then how can we possibly operate in that same system if they're not following the rules? So we will have to follow the rules that we, uh, it's a natural instinct, it's a basic human right that you can defend yourself. And that is the context of Sikhs taking up arms in 1984 and afterwards. But even those things that fought in the Darbar Sahib complex, it wasn't as though they spent their entire day in arms training. There are several books that will say that Sanjay Nal Singh had a special uh, schedule for those things that were going to be with him in 1984. That schedule revolved around incredible amounts of part. 
So that power, where did it come from? That's what I want to talk about a little bit. Next slide. Reflecting on the examples of the, uh, of, of the gurus, but particularly Guru Gobind Singh. We have a lot of fake gurus today. And we're all concerned. We have Ashutosh, we have Satya Sauda, we have Radha Swamis, we have Nam Taris. But what we forget is, at the times of the gurus, there were as many fake gurus, if not more. Prithi Chand had his own data. Tirmal had his own data. You had uh, all kinds of offshoots from the Sikh tradition that were claiming, like uh, Naranjaniye, all kinds, Handaliye. How did the gurus deal with that? One Tirmal, who was the older brother of Guru Harai Saab, he was upset that Guru Tegh Bahadur has become the next Guru. So what does he do? He organizes a mob to shoot and try and kill Guru Tegh Bahadur Saab. Guru Tegh Bahadur Saab's matha is skimmed by this bullet. The blood is coming. They see that they weren't able to kill him. They run away. Makran Shah Lubana, we know that name, but he used to be not just a rich businessman, he used to have a group of armed people with him. They go, and they go and loot the data of Tirmal, tie Tirmal up, and march him to Guru Tegh Bahadur. Guru Tegh Bahadur could have said, destroy them, kill them, take all their saman. Guru Tegh Bahadur said, let them go. Even Ad Granth Sahib, that Guru Arjan Dev Ji wrote, he gave back, said, I don't need it. And what did Tirmal say in return? The Irmal recognized, he said, these are the qualities of a, a real Guru that I accept. Guru Hargobind Sahib, he took the armed path. Mehrban, or Prithi Chand, that line, Guru Arjan Dev Ji's brother, he said, this is going against the Sikh tradition. I'll do something different. Prithi Chand's tradition continued for several generations and in fact controlled Darbar Sahib. It controlled Darbar Sahib. The Gurus could have sent armies there, but they won the hearts and minds of the people. They didn't exterminate them, they didn't kill them off. They showed them that our path is right. And eventually the Sikhs of Amritsar, in fact, invited Guru Gobind Singh to come take control of Darbar Sahib. Guru Gobind Singh didn't do it by force. Guru Gobind Singh Ji, I'm coming to a conclusion. We talk about him raising arms. But I want you to look at that example. His two sons, older, are killed in front of his eyes. His mother and two younger sons are killed at Fatehgarh Saab, at Sirhand. What does he do? He could have raised another army and challenged Aurangzeb. He could have done it. There's no reason why he couldn't have. But he writes the Zafar Nama and exposes Aurangzeb for what he's done. He says, you've oppressed people, you've lied, you've cheated. And what is the end? Does he say, I, I'm going to destroy you now? No. He says, let's have a meeting. I want to meet with you. After Aurangzeb dies and isn't able to meet, he meets with his successor, Bahadur Shah. Why did Guru Gobind Singh Ji go from Punjab to the south? Because Bahadur Shah's, his caravan was going south in the same direction. Meetings were taking place ongoing. Guru Gobind Singh attempted to talk to the regime to set them on the right path. When he saw that they're not going to be corrected, then he sends Baba Banda Singh, and Baba Banda Singh, as we know, shook the Mughal regime to its core in Punjab. But that shows that violence is not our first resort. It is our last resort when everything else has been exhausted. And Guru Gobind Singh illustrated this in the most extreme way. His own four sons are killed by this regime, and he says, let's talk. Let's have a meeting. So I want us to think about what means are available to us before taking arms, and when is it justified to react physically? That's for us to think about, and maybe we can talk about it in our discussion groups. But I just want us to have a final reflection, which is instead of focusing on dying for the guru, which is what a lot of young people I see, they have that as the ideal, that becoming a shaheed, that's I'll sacrifice my life for the panth, looking for an opportunity. Why not live for the Guru? If you haven't lived for the Guru, you cannot die for the Guru, which means if you aren't following Sikhi, you don't have Sikhi in your heart, you cannot say that I can become a Shaheed. 
Yesterday, Maninder Singh talked about how the Pant almost immediately, within a year or two, would always come back. So we talked about Sukha Singh Mehtab Singh cutting off the head of Masarangar. We talked about Jassa Singh Alu Waliya, who had uh, led the Khalsa Fawj after uh, the Vardaka Lukara. Where are they today? Today, our situation is that we don't have those leaders anymore. And those leaders, what were their jivans like? What are our, what are our jivans like? Their jivans were based fundamentally on the power of Nam. Their power didn't come through their strategies. They didn't come through uh, because they were very learned. They were learned, but it didn't come through just Syanak. It came through the Tej Pratap of Nam and Guru Sahib's Kirpa. Guru Sahib has already told us the solution. Guru Sahib has already promised us Raj. Guru Sahib has already promised us whatever we want. Jab lag khalsa rahe nyara, tab lag tej diyo mein sara. That I will give the, all my power to the Khalsa, as long as they say, stay nyara. Jabe ghe bipran ki reet, mena karo in ki prati. That when they go the path of the Brahmans, when they go the path of the world, then I won't trust them anymore. Then they can do whatever they want. If they want to be smarter than what I've told them, then let them go on their own path. Do we have the Tej of the Guru? Or, we have, or is something else happening? So obviously, we're not following the path of the Guru, and that's why we're seeing such serious problems in our Pant today. What we focus on are symptoms. We say our leadership, Badal is leading the Pant to corruption. SGPC is very bad. These are symptoms. What is the disease? What's the real disease? Badal is eventually going to die. Who's going to replace him? Is it going to be someone better than Badal? It's going to be someone worse than Badal. The SGPC, how is that going to reform? If Makkar goes away one day, do, if Tar Singh Makkar, let's say he resigns tomorrow, do we have someone better? We talk about even Khalistan. I don't see how the politics of Khalistan, based on our current spiritual levels, will be any better than the politics of Punjab. What does that mean? It means recognize not the symptoms, but the disease. The disease is that we've broken from our spiritual connection. We've broken from the Guru's path. We don't have the Guru's kirpa and the power of the Guru anymore. And the only solution is to build that jivan within ourselves. I told the story of Sanjay Nal Singh's past to show that Education is important, but what he had was bigger than education. He had the soji, he had that power of Nam and Gurbani. And without that, we can never be successful. And we can never claim to be Shaheeds, we can never claim to live our lives for the, for the Guru or for the Pant. The Guru is still asking for heads today. Guru Sahib is still calling out for our heads. He's been calling out for our heads since Guru Nanak Dev Ji's time. Question is, who's going to answer that call? The Panth needs all of us today. The Panth needs all of us to do seva. But that seva has to start with our own Nidji Jeevans. Guru Sahib is asking that you connect back to your own spirituality. And that's not for, it's not something just for the world, it's for your own selfish happiness as well. If you do that, you'll be happy, but you can also make a difference for the Panth. So with that, I know I'm over time. Uh, I hope that answers your questions about Shahidi, and I'm more than happy to talk more in our workshop about it. Waigudji ka khalsa, Waigudji ki fateh. Any questions? I think we're good then. I'm just going to reiterate some of the announcements from before the lecture because not everyone was here. Um, there was a request from Jasvinder Singh. He's one of the Sevadars. Is he here right now? No, right? Okay. He's doing, he's doing longer Seva. So the, he is? Where is he here? Yeah, come. Okay, so his request, we'll get, he, he'll make that request. The other requests are. Um, regarding, um, so his request is regarding cliques, so we'll get to that in a minute. Um, the other request was regarding Darbar, 
uh, which was the, there's two Darbar times in the day, 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. The second time, I think, is 5.30 p.m. to 7.45 p.m. Um, sometimes, you know, the evening Darbar goes until a little bit longer, till around 8. Uh, but those are the two Darbar times. Please be to Darbar on time. Uh, it's great if you come to Darbar earlier than 4 a.m., um, but do not come to Darbar earlier if you're planning to leave before 6 a.m., okay? A lot of people today miss Nitinim. Um, you shouldn't be missing Nitinim. The point of camp is to do Nitinim and Sangat together. So if you can be in Darbar for three hours in the morning, come from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. If you can be in Darbar for six hours, come from 2 a.m. and stay for Asadiwa and leave at 8 a.m. If you can only be there for two hours, come from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. It's a really kind of common sense guideline. Uh, follow the camp schedule. Uh, if you want to do extra, you're more than welcome to do extra. And everyone, I think we already did this today, everyone sit together, everyone make more of an effort to sing. Some people still are hesitant to, to sing in Darbar. Um, no one uh, is going to judge your voice or I don't know what the, the reason for the, 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 the hesitancy is. Don't be hesitant. Uh, go to Darbar, sing in Darbar, be a part of Darbar. We want to kind of make us, you know, uh, Nabrit Singh. Is Nabrit Singh here right now? By Nabrit Singh? Okay. By Nabrit Singh, talk yesterday about making us one big clique. Okay, you're right there, I saw him now. Okay, so making us one big clique. Uh, sorry, it's kind of hard to see people because of the lighting. Uh, so, uh, by Nabrit talked about making us one big clique yesterday. So, everyone just, you know, you don't, you don't just sing with your friend. You know, somebody who's doing kirtan for the first time, there's more reason to sing with that person who is a, maybe a little bit shy about doing kirtan. So just think more and more about being, you know, a positive force, coming to the bar on time, um, and having, it's just for your own benefit. You'll have a really good camp experience that way, okay? So without further ado, we'll pass it over to Pajaswinder Singh for a couple of minutes, talk about cliques. Um, but uh, after this, we have our workshops. Um, I'll just give you the workshop schedule right now. Um, group one is here in the auditorium with Bai Balpreet Singh. Uh, group two is in the Langar Hall with Bai Navreet Singh. Uh, group three is in the Darbar Hall with Bai Dilwinder Singh. And group four is with Bai Moninder Singh in the Langar Hall side room. Is Bai Moninder Singh here yet? I don't think so. He should be here soon. Um, so, but he's doing the Pantheka Shuruk, so that's in the Langar Hall side room. So just follow those places, wherever you, whichever group you were part of yesterday, be part of that same group today so you can attend all the four workshops uh, during the week. But just listen. Ka khalsa, ki fateh. I just wanted to reiterate the point yesterday made by Bai Navri Singh. Uh, I guess being British, we're just sort of brutal, we're just honest the way it is. Um, talking about cliques, um, going by my experience last year when I came, just, it took one Gursik to show me a bit of PR, turned my whole life around, brought me back to Sikhi after 10 years. The whole idea is, apa, even when we're in longer halls, try not sitting next to your friends. Sit, sit, sit next to somebody that you don't know. Get to know them. Just make them, you know, you share ideas, you get to know each other, um, share your experiences of the camp. Um, I think, and that's what we're lacking at this one at the moment, because people are going off in their own little groups, doing their own little things. Nobody's really getting to know anybody. And I think as a whole in the Panth, the biggest lack we have today is unity. There really isn't no unity and we've got to make a start somewhere. So why not do it today here? So I'm just requesting a humble request, you know, get to know the person next to you, talk to them, get out of your comfort zones, you know, and experience, you know, that's the, I think that's the only way you're going to get the full experience of Khalsa camp here today. All right. Why Guruji ka Khalsa, why Guruji ki Fateh. Oh, sorry. Yeah. One other request is, um, a request to the BBRs actually. You know, whether it comes to taking Hokam Nama, whether it comes to doing Sukhasan, you know, don't wait to be asked. We need BBR to come forward themselves and actually be actively participating. Um, 
I don't think it's really fair on the things all the time to be sort of heading or going forward. Maybe you guys are shy, I don't know what it is, but oddam dahalo, more hovo, and uh, just be at the forefront of things and share the experience. Waigurji ka khalsa, Waigurji ki fateh. So we have a 10 minute break right now just for transition. Um, so if you're in group one, you can just kind of stay here because your workshop is here today. Everybody else will have about a 10 minute transition time right now to go to uh, where you're supposed to be going. <laughs>